Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I've always believed that innovation is an overused word and is fashionable to say it, but very often very difficult to implement. And particularly when we are trying to create it as a, as a culture in a company where every day, every minute, every morning, every afternoon, uh, all employees across the organization are able to uh, thrive in that kind of culture. Uh, that is actually the culture that we need in a company today if we are to not just thrive, but even survive. And what I've tried to do in the next 15, 20 odd minutes is to try and, uh, and uh, to try and decipher what does that exactly mean and what needs to be done. Um, let me just quickly get to, you know, you see these three pictures and everybody recognizes all of them. Uh, the first one is a wooden wheel invented sometime 3500 BC in Mesopotamia. Uh, and it was basically used as a potter's wheel. And in a way, all, all these three, if you look at the second one, which is a printing press invented in 1440 by Johannes Gutenberg, and the mobile phone and earlier, its earlier version, the actual telephone, first one, a phone invented by, by Bell, and the second one by Martin Cooper, you can see that these are basically what we would call inventions. These are not innovations. These are absolutely new creative products, ideas, uh, and items which have been created out of nothing. In fact, if you look at the wooden wheel, it's interesting that this was the first uh, invention that came which did not have any replicant in nature. And that gives it a very unique uh, position as being the first real invention that came about. Um, but, an invention is a bit like a, a newborn baby. It has a lot of potential, uh, but uh, frankly, the use often immediately is quite limited. And therefore, uh, this has to be converted into innovation uh, if we are to make it happen. And innovation is something that takes invention to scale. Uh, typically, innovations require entrepreneurship. It requires a, a leader who is able to lead an organization through ideas, and who's able to then look at the same piece and look at it differently and say, what can be done? They are normally not the inventors. So for example, Steve Jobs did not create the first computer. Bill Gates never wrote the first line of operating system code and Howard, Sh Howard Schultz of Starbucks did not experiment and create the best quality coffee bean. And yet three have transformed each of their respective industries. A continuously innovative company also has to have a massive transformation purpose because doing ordinary things will not achieve the kind of breakthrough innovations that are necessary in today's world. Innovation, quite simply speaking, is discontinuous improvement. Continuous improvement, we all know, but how do you create a company and how do you create a virtuous cycle of discontinuous improvement where you, on a regular cyclical basis, you're able to transform and disrupt things that are going on in the company? When you look at innovation, everybody knows this product life cycle chart that, you know, you sort of put something new out there. You get the first innovators, the people who have invented it, who have been part of the product who are, or the service, who use it. This is the first couple of percent of people who would do it. And these are the people who are sort of around that creation or that innovation. And then, of course, there are always the early adopters in a company or in a consumer landscape. And these people will always look at new things that are coming out and will invent them and will, and will use them. But then most innovations reach, reach what's called a chasm because this is where you got to make the big leap. This is where we really have to see how do you create a beachhead on the other side where the major consumers and the major users lie. And typically this requires four things. This requires speed because while crossing this chasm, it's important that the existing uh, big companies or the people who currently own the consumer space in the, in the entirety of the majority are not responding at a level where they don't allow you to cross the chasm and you fall, you fall down. The second is agility, uh, the ability to make sure that your innovation is able to change and pivot depending on what the early majority is wanting to see on the other side with speed. The third piece is force. One has to be really 
uh, that there has to be an emotional and a creative force that takes you across the chasm. The massive transformation purpose, the big entrepreneurial leader, the one who leads people from the front, who leads from the ability to have the power of his idea across the chasm is absolutely critical at this point. And the last is what I would call perseverance, because it's not as if this chasm can be uh, can be crossed in a day. Very often it requires a fair amount of work before anything can really happen on the other side. Very often there are multiple failures, multiple pivotings that are necessary and beachheads have to be established on the other side before this sort of chasm has to be crossed. But once it's done, it can be a, a, a phenomenal win. And let me give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. And let me take away, you know, the creativity that is so important in crossing the chasm. And let me, I mean, let us let me not take an example from technology, which is usually often quoted, but take an example of an ice cream. Ice cream has been around for hundreds of years. We all enjoy it. In fact, low calorie ice cream has been around for, for at least 30, 40, 50 years, and everybody knows that it's available, but we often don't, 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 don't really go there and, and it's never caught on. Until there was one brand called Halo Top in the US about five or seven years ago, who came up with this incredible idea that people don't actually want to eat low calorie ice cream. What they really want to understand is if it can play a central part in their weight loss program. And they basically said that this tub or this bucket of ice cream has so many calories. And by the way, if you eat this ice cream as a weight loss, part of a weight loss program, you will lose weight. This created a massive transformation, a massive discontinuity in what ice cream stood for, because people mostly thought that ice cream was fattening. When this one turned, it turned that proposition on its head. And therefore, they were able to then establish that beachhead on the other side, got the majority. And before the large companies could wake up, and many did eventually, and tried to copy that proposition. And now there is a very big segment of the ice cream market which goes towards weight loss. But Halo Top took a very big chunk of the market and made hundreds of millions of dollars of business before anybody could even wake up. There's another example where the chasm was crossed through perseverance, where the transformation occurred uh, just in the industry. Uh, so take the people who founded the online airline booking systems. These are people who hung around for seven, eight, 10 years, trying to see if they could actually cross the chasm and persevered until the discount airlines came and travel exploded. And at that time, online booking, because that was very important as part of the uh, cost saving that was necessary and the effectiveness that was necessary for massive bookings to happen uh, in a very cost effective manner happened. And therefore all the online booking platforms suddenly took off and they then started However, the other point that I want to make is that there is now no completed product life cycle. Multiples, and by the time you get to the top, you are almost having to start the next one instantly, and the one after, and the one after, and the one after. Uh, it's not as if you can last through one product life cycle and forget about, you know, and then you can say, I can wait and find my next innovation a little later. There has to be a continuity and a multiplicity of innovations that have to happen. Everybody knows about the Kodak moment. Everybody knows that Kodak went from film to the, the industry went from film to digital and what happened to Kodak. But that's not where it stopped because when it went from film to digital, digital cameras came about and then cell phones happened and then they took over with the same degree of, uh, uh, of, 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 of power that normal, very large cameras, digital cameras and expensive cameras were doing it. And then finally you got Instagram and Google Photos and others which converted photography into experience and the ability to access it almost at will. And if you look at it, those are multiple innovation curves that happened one after the other. And if you were not willing to catch the industry along this full wave, you would never be able to succeed beyond a few years. Not only does innovation move now fast, but it also has a half-life, which is actually very small. The average half-life, for example, of a learned skill used to be 30 years, now it's five. The average tenure of an S&P 500 company used to be 33 years, now it's come down to less than 15. And there are four things that are happening, which I would call are creating the next wave of innovation speed or what we would call e-innovation. The first is that Moore's Law is eating the world. Uh, everything in, in, in its price performance is actually computed 
and doubling and in fact improving in its efficiency and effectiveness almost every couple of years. If you take 3D printing, the average cost has dropped 400 times in seven years. If you take drones, 142 times in six years. DNA sequencing, 10,000 times in seven years. So the speed with which the price performance equation is changing is quite dramatic. And this requires continuous effort and continuous shifts in how we think as the technology transforms this equation. The second is that there's a huge convergence of technologies. A large amount of the product and physical substrate is now converting to information layers. And as that happens, technology change is quite dramatic. Because otherwise, what tends to happen when you have a physical substrate, there is a, there is a limitation to the speed with which things can happen. There's a limitation to which, by which the speed of transformation and transition can happen. Let me give you an example from, a, from, a, uh, from, a, from the CPG space. When the channels of distribution were physical, let's say even in a country like India, the maximum amount of, if you, even if you had 100% coverage, and that is almost impossible. Most of the best companies in, in, in the country rarely have more than 15, 20, 30, 40% coverage. But even 100% coverage would get you to 8 million shops. These would be all kinds of shops, whether they were small outlets, tabletops, large shops, malls, everything. Across the country, urban, rural, you're talking of 8 million outlets. The minute you convert the physical channel into a virtual channel, into a digital channel, the Amazons, the Flipkarts, whatever else are there, you are now talking of tens of millions and effectively you can go to 20 crore or 25 crore households right and that completely transforms a business and we have seen that in covid times so physically that's really transformed what's happened if you then look at the third aspect is that when the physical layer transforms to a digital layer assets become different as well as long as you depend on physical assets, there is a hierarchy in the company. And frankly speaking, the utilization and the amount of asset investments will then govern growth. But the minute you get into things like, let's say, LinkedIn, which basically digitizes trust or Google's as algorithms, which digitize or digitizing global information, there is now no limit to the amount of assets that can be used. And particularly when these assets become digitized or they are shared or in fact leveraged, uh the growth is almost limitless and therefore i think this is the third element of leveraged assets let me give you one example uh if you if you if you if you go back in a little bit of time nokia bought a company called navtech in 2007 for about eight billion dollars navtech was the world's leader in road traffic and sensor industry and nokia thought that they would therefore dominate uh the ability to have uh to to be able to do track and trace and do traffic management etc cetera, etc cetera. Unfortunately, a small Israeli company got Waze was also founded around the same time. Everybody knows what Waze does. It basically used the crowdsourcing by leveraging GPS central investment, zero user acquisition costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The rest is history. Nokia's market cap eventually, not just for this, but over many other things, fell from 140 billion to 8 billion when it was sold to Microsoft. By the way, 8 billion was exactly the amount that Nokia bought Nav 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 Navtech with. So you can imagine that when you leverage assets which are around and you don't have to own them, what can happen in terms of innovation? And the last but not the least uh, element that is so critical to innovation now is called what I call 10,000 experiments. Malcolm Gladwell very famously wrote, wrote in his book that you have to spend 10,000 hours to get expert at anything. I think the new uh, element of innovation is to have 10,000 experiments. It's not about it's not about the success of these experiments, but the speed with which they happen. Because when you are able to do 10,000 or more experiments fast, there is an inevitability to the speed of innovation uh, changing also at the same time. And this is now not just restricted to business. There is also a power of innovation which is there now in solving social problems. Already, solar and wind power are cheaper than a third of the coal that's being used and and probably by 2030 95% or 96% of the existing coal plants will be more expensive than these alternative forms of energy vehicle sales you can see electric vehicle sales are expanding in fact they are exploding it's not just tesla we are now talking of different forms there are container ships which are being experimented with electricity there are aeroplanes which are being experimented with electricity 
uh, and so on. So you are seeing a transformation in energy. You are seeing a transformation, slow but definitely in plastics. Uh, the world, you know, generates about 300 million tons of plastic waste. Only 16% is recycled. This we know is untenable, and very quickly consumers are now revolting against this. And very soon we will have massive shifts happening in technology, so that a large part of this is recycled. This is the same as happening in water, and we all know the problem of drinking water and the ability, the sanitation requirements for large parts of the world, which don't exist. What's going to happen? And clearly here also massive innovations in communities, massive innovations in technology, massive innovations in waterless devices is occurring so that we are able to change this world in terms of providing drinking water to everybody and great sanitation at affordable prices without the use of too much water. So effectively, innovation really is now in a way the, uh, the sort of the, 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 the life of every company. Uh, it's got to be done in a cultural way. It's got to be done in a manner which is continuous. It's got to be done with the speed, with the four things that will change the culture. Moore's law, which is eating up everything in the world. The technology convergence that is happening. The asset leveraging that needs to be done. And last but not the least, how fast, how many experiments can I do to make sure that my people and my company continuously innovate? Thank you. Is it discount continuous innovation as uh, you say that it cannot be termed as a, uh, as innovation in that sense? Look, I don't want to, um, you know, uh, penny pinch here. At the end of the day, uh, a large part of business continues to happen with continuous improvement uh, because continuous improvement really runs the engine. Uh, and in fact, if you put together a large part of continuous improvement, you probably don't recognize what happened a little while later. So it is a continuum. Uh, I don't think that you know, I would want to uh, trash continuous improvement. But I, I think it's also important to switch mind frame from continuous improvement regularly in as, as a business team to say <coughs> happening to our industry across four points I raised because it's very important to understand and back in a pretty significant time span in the company what's happening to the experimentation that's happening to this organization of the technologies that are being used. I think if that assessment is done, discontinuous improvement is going to happen. Thanks, Dawal.